Welcome to Valley Forge Baptist Temple, and Happy New Year to you. Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We'd like to modify that today and say, This is the year the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's come into God's presence and ask for His power, His leading, His blessing as we seek Him in 2016. May we pray together. Our Father, we're grateful to be in your house in this beginning Sunday of the new year, and I pray that we will seek you, we will love you, we will serve you, and we will obey you. And Father, we pray that as we can claim your promises, that as we walk in the ways of God, as we trust in you and lean upon you and acknowledge you, that you will direct our path. And we pray that as we look to 2016, that this church family will be a lighthouse to our community, our state, our country, and our world uh, through all that we do for Jesus Christ. May you lead us. May you guide us. May you fill us with your power. May we make a difference in the lives of others beginning in our own home and church family as we put you first. Prepare our hearts uh, to seek you now and that we'd have your power. We do rejoice in your blessings. We thank you for your comfort in trial. We pray for those that are in recovery today, that you will continue to minister to each one of them. And now, Father, we give this service to you, and I pray that you would help us to start the year off right uh, in your house, in your ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're visiting for the first time, we want to thank you for being out and welcome you. Just raise your hand for a moment if this is your first time at Valley Forge Baptist. We'd like to pass one of our welcome booklets to you. If you've never received one, just raise your hand as the rushers come by, and you can take that, and please fill it out and drop that into the offering plate in a few moments. Good to have Terry Lush with us. Terry was three weeks in the hospital, and he is out today. So welcome, Terry, and Happy New Year to you. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique diet plan. Go to the hospital for three weeks, lose 30 pounds. And so uh, uh, we're glad he is out, and good to have a son here as well. And you uh, pray for him and his recovery.
Thank you, choir, for that song this morning. Would you take your hymn books out and turn to page 531 this morning? Let's all stand as we sing together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Page 531. We'll sing all four verses together this morning. All hail the power. Take a moment and greet someone. as you find your seats there. We'll continue to sing in just a moment. If you have not received a copy of the notes for pastor's message this morning, the ushers are coming down the aisles now. Raise your hand and let me make sure to get a copy of those to you. We'll continue to sing this morning our theme chorus from last year one more time. Renew us, Lord, come in and take full control. Renew. Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence. We'll sing the first, the fourth, and the last. I stand amazed in the presence of
Singing this morning, please be seated. I trust you had a good holiday time with family and friends. Uh, we were down with my parents in Virginia uh, celebrating my dad's 90th birthday. We did a nice surprise for him there at the church after the evening service to be able to go into the foyer and surprise him there. So that was a, a joyous time. And then, as, uh, as far as other family news, uh, our second son, Jeremy, who uh, works at a ministry, serves in a ministry in Guam at Harvest Baptist Church. He was uh, on vacation with his uh, girlfriend's family in Thailand, and they became engaged on top of an elephant. And so, a most unique way to be able to get engaged. And so, the uh, one elephant uh, had the bag in the ring and handed it back. Uh, to Katie, and uh, she could fill it in there, and, and then he proposed, and so tonight we'll see if I can show you a picture uh, of the elephant uh, engagement, and so we rejoice with Jeremy and Katie. She also is on staff uh, there at that ministry. She's a teacher in the Christian school, and also um, uh, I think one of their coaches in, in the uh, children's soccer league. And so we rejoice with, uh, with God, God's blessings there. They've known each other uh, for many years, and uh, we're glad to, to be able to see that. He has lunch with his, his uh, future father-in-law every Friday, who's former military. I kind of like that. And so, uh, so that's good. As the rushers come to be able to uh, receive our offering today as we worship and giving, I want you to know how God is using our missionaries. And I received this about 10 days ago from Brother Freeman. Uh, he received a call. And uh, let me just share the email that uh, he sent to me. I was called to meet the president yesterday and received the following award. This is the president of Taiwan. I have very few I could share this with the ministry, but I knew you were one of those that would like to share this with Lou, Louise, and I. I was given an honorary seat at the table of the nation as a counselor of righteousness of the Chinese people of Taiwan. In the next slide, you see him here with the president. Quite an honor for us. Thanks for helping us be here all of these years, uh, Dan and Lou. And so this is the current president of Taiwan. I wrote back and said, is this something I could share with the church family? He said, well, it was a public event. It was on live TV. And so in the last uh, slide here, uh, you see a certificate uh, that he received uh, to the certificate of award. Reverend Daniel Lee Freeman has devoted nearly 40 years of his life to serving the people of Taiwan. Originally from the United States, he has demonstrated deep concern for the development of teenagers, providing counseling and education and employment. He's also assisted foreign workers in Taiwan, guiding them in matters of faith and daily life. Reverend Freeman embodies the values of benevolence and righteousness and is widely known for his compassion and empathy. In recognition of Reverend Freeman's selflessness and mature meritorious deeds, the government of the Republic of China hereby confers upon him the order of brilliant star with violet grand cordon. And it's signed Ma Ying Jiao, President, Republic of China, Taiwan. And so not too many of our missionaries get called up by the uh, president of their country and said, come on over, we'd like to give you an award. 
Uh, but that's the kind of man uh, and husband and wife team that we've supported all these years in Taiwan. Uh, this, uh, I think he's been on a, uh, uh, a friendship personal name basis with the last three presidents uh, of Taiwan. Uh, truly, truly uh, the uh, a blessing of God uh, to be able to see uh, his influence. And as I think about that, uh, what a uh, testimony for us to aspire to, uh, to uh, be considered a counselor of righteousness. A counselor of righteousness. And may that be our desire, that we would live in such a way that even unsaved people would say, you know, they love God, they love people, and they live righteousness. So as you give your tithes and offerings and your missions offering today, I just want you to know what kind of, of uh, ministry partners we have uh, through our missionaries. Uh, what a special blessing. This is the man that leads the Asian Pastors Conference that we will be hosting in uh, November 2nd to 6th. Uh, thank you for many of you who signed up to host uh, 50 of the uh, Asian pastors and wives this coming fall. It's going to be an exciting year, and we're glad you're here on the very first Sunday to be part of that. Several mission trips planned. We have Celebration Sunday next week, and we have a great theme that we'll be emphasizing and looking forward to all the things that God has planned for us. And we want to seek the Lord and be a part of what he's doing. I'd like to ask Brother Peter Rawl, who'll be leading one of those mission trips in 2016, if he'd ask God's blessings upon our offering today. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts, recognizing that you are the Creator God, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You alone are worthy of our praise and our majesty, and we give you that this morning. Father, we thank you for this great news of Brother Freeman, Father, and the honor bestowed upon him. Father, we just thank you for the light that he shines there in Taiwan. We thank you for his ministry and pray your continued blessing upon him specifically upon his health needs, Father, that you would continue to sustain him by your grace there in Taiwan. We thank you for the blessings of 2015. And Father, now is this first Sunday of a new year, 2016. We, with thrill in our hearts, look forward to what you have for us here as a church. And we would pray and ask for continued wisdom and leadership of our pastoral staff this year, giving them the wisdom that they need as they guide and direct this ministry. For us as a congregation, that we might allow you to work in and through us to spread the gospel, to care for others. Father, to be a part of this body using our gifts and talents any way we can. Thank you for the missionary emphasis that we have. We would ask your blessing now upon the rest of this service for the preaching of Pastor Wendell, that you'd give him clarity of thought and mind as he brings the word of God to us, that our hearts truly would be open. And we pray for your blessing upon this offering to be taken. Continue to use these monies both here and abroad, and we'll give you the praise and the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I seek your face and humbly pray. Lead me on to higher ways unknown to men. Guide me in the path you have for me. Place me in the blessings of your master plan. Oh, to feel your presence is my plea. Oh, to feel your presence is my plea. Lord, when I'm on the mountain high, help me never to forget your grace. Lord, when I'm in the valley dry, keep me looking toward your loving face. When the storms of life never seem to end, billows roll so strong and I am weak. 
Hold me close within the shelter of your hand. Oh, to feel your presence is my plea. Oh, to feel your presence is my plea. Lord, as I come before your throne, singing praise and honor to your name. Lord, glory is to you alone, for your power still remains the same. Give me strength and wisdom only you possess, for your Stay with me and fill me with your righteousness. Oh, to feel your presence is my plea. Lord, to feel your presence is my plea. Let me feel your presence. Amen. Thank you, Josh, for that song today. May we seek God and sense his presence and leadership and power in our life this year. Please open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20 this morning. 2 Kings chapter 20. We have a very fascinating story here that tells us a lot about ourselves and a lot about God. It's a great story to begin our new year off on the right foot. It's about a good king, a godly man named Hezekiah. He was one of the few good kings in Israel that built some lasting things. For those of us who have visited the Holy Land, Hezekiah left us two things to see and to touch that are 2,700 years old. The first and most amazing thing that he left us is the ancient water tunnel dug underneath the city of Jerusalem to bring water from the spring Gihon, which was outside the city wall. You can see here in this map, uh, uh, to the pool of Siloam. It is called Hezekiah's Tunnel. I've walked through the 1,750-foot-long tunnel three times. The first time was in 1978 when I was a teenager at Bible College. It was not open to the public, but one of my college professors found a guy who had a key to the gate. And with candles and flashlights, uh, we walked the tunnel. And the next two times was with many of you. And so over the years, uh, here you see the Bowmans. And the next slide, let's see here, we have Terry and uh, uh, we have the Joiners and Buckmans there in the background. And the next slide, uh, we have the Elstocks, Jamie, and then that's Beth Capaletti, our missionary uh, in the background there. And then also uh, the Floros, and uh, I think it's Larry, Moyer back there, and here's Antoinette and, and uh, Anne and Andrew back there. And then some others have gone as well. But on the next slide, I want you to, uh, uh, oh, look what I found in the tunnel. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want you to look at the, the, the carving here. It, it, to me, it's fascinating to touch the walls, feel the chisel marks made by construction workers nearly 3,000 years ago. And then the last couple slides here, you see some others that went on a trip with the Elstocks. Uh, uh, yeah, there you see the frames and Stan Hess and Brother Schneider. And then in the last slide, uh, their group that was uh, that one a year after that we had gone as, uh, as well. And I just, it just, what's amazing about it is whatever the Bible says is true. I mean, it's just true. If it talks about history, it's true. If it talks about prophecy, it's true. If it talks about life or marriage uh, uh, or theology, it's always true. And so... Now to the story and the lessons we can learn from Hezekiah. My message is entitled, Prepared. Set your house in order. Please stand with me as I read to you of King Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 20, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy, thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. 
Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you that we can look into the Word of God, we can find direction of how we can prepare our hearts and lives for 2016. Give us the clear direction, godly goals, that we would set ourselves on a course that we might live lives that would be pleasing to you and that the hand of God will be upon us, that we might sense that presence that Josh just sung about. And may we walk pleasing in your sight as Hezekiah did. May we value what you have said in your word. And may with obedient and faithful hearts, we obey what you've told us to do. Now, Father, bless in these few moments together. May you speak to each one. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Prepared. Are you prepared for 2016? The prophet Isaiah's message to the king reminds me of a, well, a humorous story about Dave and Mike, both in their 90s, and they played baseball together all of their lives, and after they retired, they continued to watch professional baseball and remain close friends. Dave became sick. Mike visited Dave in his deathbed. As they're reminiscing about their long friendship, Mike asks, listen, Listen, when you die, do me a favor. I want to know if there's baseball in heaven. The dying man said, if the Lord permits, that I will do for you. And then he dies. A few days after Dave died, Mike is sleeping when he hears Dave's voice. Dave says, Mike, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is, yes, there is baseball in heaven. Mike says, great, what's the bad news? The bad news is you're pitching tomorrow night. That's kind of basically what Isaiah is saying here to King Hezekiah. You're up to bat in heaven. In verse 1, look what he says. In those days, Hezekiah is sick unto death. The prophet Isaiah comes and says, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Thus saith the Lord, you're sick, you're going to die. Isaiah says, God told me, to tell you to update your will because you're going to die. God bless and have a good day. And he walked out. I'm sure the king is thinking, well, happy new year to you too. Uh, this message was from God. Set your house in order because you're going to die. We use that phrase today. Set your house in order. It comes from verse 1. And today it usually means, it means to get organized. It means to get ready to die. There in your notes, it means make or update your will. Set your house in order. If you're married, it means buy life insurance. It means get out of debt. It means get your health screening tests. I've given you a website there. Uh, I, I know I've got a, an honorary doctorate, but uh, I'm not a medical doctor. But go to this website, and it'll tell you by age which screening medical test 
you should get. You know who I'm talking to. Reasons we do not get medical screening tests. I'll give you three. Fear, finances, and foolishness. Fear. Uh, some are afraid to get those medical screening tests uh, because you, you fear the test or you fear the results. Finances. Uh, you don't want to spend, it might be hundreds of dollars uh, to get that test, but yet you will spend thousands of dollars on a car that is going to break down. And then foolishness. If you take care of your body about half as good as you take care of your car, you might live a little longer. Uh, we change the oil in our cars about every three to 4,000 miles. Your body is 1,000 times. No, no, no. Your body is a million times more valuable than the car that you drive. Uh, here's some more things to get set your house in order uh, regarding the physical side. Uh, weight loss goals, exercise goals. Uh, how about Bible reading goals, some spiritual goals? How about sharing, sharing your faith goals? How, how about to say, you know, in 2016, I'm going to have a goal to hand out 10 tracts a week. That's about one a day, or, or maybe in a couple of days, you might be able to give out two or three. He said, ah, you know, it doesn't make any difference. What people do is they just throw them away. They just throw them away. Well, I'm here today to remind you that in 1975, someone uh, put a track up. They didn't even hand it to someone. They, they, put it, they put it on the counter of Natoli's Sunoco service station. Don't even know who did it. But I do know when I get to heaven, I'm going to find out what Christian did that and I will be one of many to thank him because that track brought me to a church, Fairfax Baptist Temple, where I heard Bud Calvert preach the gospel and I got saved. So maybe you're going to put some tracks out and you won't even know until heaven. I would, I would dare say that if you did 10 tracks a week, 520 tracks a year, and you do that for, say, 10 years, 5,000 tracks, I believe there's going to be a line of people that will come to you and say, thank you. Thank you. It's 2016. It's time to make some goals. It's time to set your house in order. What does set your house in order mean to you? What does it mean to me as we begin 2016? Well, it means to organize your life. It means to, to really take a few moments and make some good and godly goals for the new year. Jesus said the most important thing in life is your salvation. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? So if you've come to the house of God this morning and you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart and you've not yet been born again, it really doesn't matter what you do in your life, that this is your greatest need. Your greatest need is to be able to become a child of God. So my first point clearly would be prepare to meet God. Prepare to meet God. This is what Amos told the Jewish people. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Are you prepared to meet God? Do you know that more than, more than half a dozen of our own church members went to their heavenly home in 2015? And we miss them. We miss them, but they are rejoicing. And, and many of you, dozens of you, lost family members to this life uh, during, this, uh, during this, this last year as well. Now is the time to prepare to meet God. We all need to come to grips with, with um, the fact that we are going to die someday. Uh, on, on the bottom of page one, there's a, uh, there's a reference there from, from Moses. He wrote one psalm. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I'd like to show you a life expectancy table. Uh, now, these are only averages these are not promises. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So if, you're, if your eyes are good, uh, you can take a look up here and find your age and how long you can expect to live. And so when the teenagers get in here, uh, they're, they're going to say, a 15-year-old might say, Well, you know, I'm going to live to be 62. I'm going to have to come way down here. I'm 55 and so, on average, I've got about 25 years left. Where are you on the chart? Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. 
These are averages, not promises. We don't know who will be amongst us here one year from now in 2017. But now is the time to set your house in order to prepare to meet God. There's only one way to prepare to meet God. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The only way you can be forgiven of your sins is to receive God's free gift of eternal life, to become a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, a true Christian. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, as we talk about preparing to meet God, I wanted to take a few moments to talk about the errors about salvation to compare that to the truth. So, two errors about salvation. One is called uh, hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism. There's actually five points of it. I just want to show you one of those points today. It's called unconditional election. This is the false view of election. So I have a quote there from a famous Calvinist. His name is John Piper. This is what he says. Unconditional election is God's free choice before creation, not based on foreseen faith, to which traitors he will grant faith and repentance and adopting them into the everlasting family of joy. Later he wrote, Before you were born or had done anything good or bad, God chose whether to save you or not. But the Bible says, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We'll look at that in two weeks. If your salvation is predetermined, if your salvation is irresistible, why would God ask you to, to look into your own heart and make sure that you are saved? Why would God say, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith or not? So what is the truth about election? Well, we'll give you a definition of a couple of the words here. The word elect, it means to choose from a number. And God does elect. I, I believe in your notes here, you can see, I chose Israel, God said in Ezekiel 20. There are the elect angels, 1 Timothy 5, 21. Those are the good angels. And we are God's elect. Uh, who shall lay a charge against God's elect? Romans 8, 33. He hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. And so the question is not, does God elect people? Uh, the question is not, uh, does God choose people for salvation? Clearly he does. The question is, what is the election or the choosing based upon? And the Bible tells us the answer to that question. And so there in your notes, if you would, if you have a pen or pencil, would you put a star on both sides of 1 Peter 1, 2. It is extremely important that you do not get drawn into a false error. Election is based on foreknowledge. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You can underline the word foreknowledge. You cannot come up with unconditional election by reading the Bible alone. If you just read the Bible, you have to conclude that election is conditional. What is the condition? God's foreknowledge, according to the Apostle Peter in the Word of God. What is foreknowledge? It means to know ahead of time. Only God can do that. And so let me take you to uh, 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 the Strong's uh, Dictionary. It's uh, actually, they, they number the words, and so it's 4267. It is uh, pro gnosko, and it's a compound word, pro meaning before, gno uh, gnosis, gnosko, to know, and so it means to foreknow. Uh, used in the New Testament of God, pre knowing all choices and doing so without predetermining them. That's the definition of the word in 1 Peter 1 to elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Foreknowledge means to know before, to know ahead of time. May I say it very clearly so we are not led into confusion? God does not give me or a Calvinist the freedom to redefine the words that he wrote and chose in the Bible. I cannot redefine foreknowledge to mean some kind of predestination or some type of hyper-Calvinism. I have more respect, I have more reverence for God's Word than those who freely change the Bible to fit their erroneous theology. God does know who will be saved and who will not be saved. 
God is omniscient. God knows everything that has happened and everything that will happen. God knows the past, present, and future, and I know that is beyond our understanding. Uh, one of our senior citizens many years ago shared a chart with me, uh, and, and we're just trying to grasp our mind around eternity. And so this elderly man, he drew this circle, and the big circle is eternity. There is no time. Eternity is forever. But in Genesis chapter 1, God made the world in six days, and the clock began ticking, and rec recorded time began. And it will go on for several thousand years. And after the 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth, uh, Revelation chapter 20, time will end, and we are back into eternity, and time is no more. God perfectly sees the timeline of history all at once. From eternity past to eternity future, God saw how you would respond when the gospel would be presented to you. He also saw the native in the jungle, how they would respond to the light of creation, how they would respond to the light of, of conscience. He sees it all. And 1 Peter 1, 2 says this foreknowledge of the future is the basis of his election. You do have a responsibility to believe and receive Jesus Christ. Uh, here's a quote from Henry Thiessen, Systematic Theology, uh, a basic uh, theological book that most Bible colleges and seminaries have. He chose those who he foreknew would accept Christ. The Scriptures definitely base God's election on his foreknowledge. It is man's reaction to the revelation God has made of himself that is the basis of his election. In his foreknowledge, he perceives what each one will do with his knowledge of their choice of him. Now, Calvinists claim that God randomly, like a lottery, chose some people to go to heaven and most people to go to hell uh, like a lottery of bad luck. They claim that God picks and chooses favorites for no apparent reason. That is not true. One former Calvinist writes, Suppose this is true, that before you were born or had done anything good or bad, God chose whether to save you or not. If I believed that, I'd be terrified to have children. I live in constant fear that perhaps they weren't chose before they were born, and they would be damned to fiery torment no matter how much I love them and try to point them to Jesus." This is a false view of salvation. Then there's Arminianism. Uh, Jacob Arminius, he rightly said, Christ died for the entire world, not just for the elect. He rightly said, the Holy Spirit causes a person, a person to be born again. He rightly said, God gives grace to everyone, enabling them to respond to the gospel. But a person may use their free will to accept or reject God's invitation to salvation. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, Titus 2.11. His error, however, his error is, he says you can walk away from God, and he said you can lose your salvation. That is an error. These are two errors about salvation. Hyper-Calvinism and Arminianism that says you can lose your salvation. So what is the biblical view? A biblical view is John 3.16. Yes, John 3, 16. I mean, you put the whole Bible into a nutshell. You put the whole Bible into one verse. You've got John 3, 16. It is the most famous verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's repeated in Revelation 22, the last book of the Bible, in case we missed it. We come to the last chapter, the last few verses, and God says this. The spirit and the bride, that's the church, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. Now listen, and whosoever will, whosoever will, that is anybody that wants to, let him take of the water of life freely. Now, of course, we cannot come unless the Father draws him but this is the will of the Father, that all come to him. And so the truth is, once saved, always saved. If you are truly born again, 
you will always be saved. Ephesians 4.30, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, Jesus said, you are in my, my hand. I'm in the Father's hand. John 10, 28, 29. You cannot lose your salvation. I would be a liar if I said God doesn't love everyone. It is a lie to say that Jesus didn't die for all the people of the world. Because in your Bible, you'll find 1 John 2, 2. And he, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, the elect, but also for the sins of the whole world. You say, what does this have to do with, with us and Hezekiah? And the answer is everything everything. If you're going to set your house in order, the first thing you're going to have to do is prepare to meet God, and you have to accept the responsibility that when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're to respond. You have a choice to receive or reject, to accept or resist. You say, do you understand everything about predestination, election, and free will of man? Of course I don't. And the people who do, you need to stay away from them, all right? <laughs> they think too highly of themselves. If they say they figured out God. The, this river of salvation has two banks. On one, one side is the bank of the free will of man, the responsibility of man. On the other side is the sovereignty of God. And if you take away one of those banks, you have a flood and a swamp. I'll just say it this way. In my finite, simple mind... The gate of heaven says this, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. And I walk through that gate one day, and when I'm in heaven, I'm going to look at the very same gate, and it's going to say on the other side, chosen before the foundation of the world. Say, do you believe in the sovereignty of God? Absolutely. Do you believe in election? Absolutely. Do I believe that God predestinated without elect according to a foreknowledge? No. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. And you can believe the Bible too. Don't let writers confuse you. Stick with the Bible. And so, prepare to meet God. Secondly, cultivate a prayer life. Cultivate a prayer life. Verse 2. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Well, I'd say so. If you get the news you're going to die, I think you'd pray too. Uh, in fact, I'm sure you will. Uh, here, if you would turn back one page to chapter 19, and here is King Hezekiah uh, when he has been king for four years. He's now 29 years of age, and his city is surrounded by 185,000 enemy Assyrian soldiers who have been just sweeping through the Middle East. 2 Kings 19, verse 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that he is surrounded and he is going to die, that he rent his clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he went into the house of the Lord. Verse 15, Nine, chapter 19, verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth, dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone. All of all the kingdoms of the earth thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear, open Lord, thine eyes, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. He says, God, defend me for your honor. And God sent one angel. That angel may be the Lord Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, a pre-incarnate appearing of Christ. And, and that angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, so much so that Sennacherib in his, his prism of his exploits writes, and I shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. You know, he couldn't say, I took the city. He couldn't say, I took the city because he didn't take the city. The Bible's true. The Bible's accurate. And God answered his prayer. Now, at the end of his life, he is told the news he's going to die from a sickness. And again, he prays. That's what we see in verse 2. He prays. We're to pray. We're to pray. We're to pray for people to be saved. If you follow Calvin, then praying for a lost person has absolutely no effect on them. Makes no sense. 
Here, here's Dave. Let's, let's say for a moment that Dave is, is uh, not a Christian man, and I, I come to Dave, and, and, and say he's my next-door neighbor, and you know, I give him a track, and I tell him my testimony, and I want to explain to him uh, how to be saved, and then, then at dinner that night, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for Dave to be saved. Well, if I'm a Calvinist, it's, it's already been determined. I mean, it was determined before the foundation of the world. He's either got an X or an O. My prayer has no impact upon Dave's salvation. It's predetermined. But I don't follow Calvin. I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. And this is what Jesus taught us about prayer. Jesus said, I want you to pray for your enemies. I want you to pray for your persecutors. And that is a prayer of salvation because that's what Jesus did when he's hanging on a cross. He's dying for our sins and he prays a prayer. It's one of his seven sayings. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He is praying for the salvation of his persecutors, which he taught us to do in Matthew 5, 44. And God the Father heard that prayer. He answered that prayer. He sent the conviction of the Spirit of God. And one of those two thieves said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. On the day of Pentecost, uh, 50 days after the resurrection, Peter preaches and says, you've killed the Lord of glory. And they were cut to their heart. They said, what shall we do? And the Spirit of God brought conviction, and the prayer of Jesus for their salvation was answered, and 3,000 people received Jesus Christ, and they were baptized, and they joined the church all on the same day of Pentecost. Matthew 9, 38, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into the harvest field. Why would Jesus tell us today to pray for labors into the harvest field? Why? That they would preach the gospel so people could get saved. I want you to listen to the prayer of the apostle Paul in Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's prayer, my heart's desire and prayer to God For Israel is that they might be what? Saved. Don't let people tell you, oh, you can't pray for people's salvation. Paul did. Jesus did. We should pray for people's salvation as well. When we're praying for people to be saved, we are praying God's will. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. I've got a, I've got a wonderful pamphlet written by Dr. E.R. Jordan. Some of you know him from years ago. He says, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminianist. I'm a Biblicist. I'm a Biblicist. And I, 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 plant, I plant my feet on the same ground. I'm a Biblicist. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe in the responsibility of man. Do I have it all figured out? No. But I'm I'm good. I'm good to know that when I get to heaven, I can say, God, I believed, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Hezekiah prayed when he was sick. It's true of us. When a doctor says, you have stage four cancer, what are you going to do? You're going to pray. When a doctor says, you need a emergency open heart surgery tomorrow, you begin to pray today. I mean, even the atheists begin to pray when they get news like that. A former, that former Calvinist also wrote, if everything is predestined or predetermined, I don't think I would even pray to God about anything because if God didn't care enough about most of his creation to save them, why should he care about anything in my life? But I'm here to tell you today that God does care. He does care. He does love you. Uh, if God cares, if God cares, then people want to know, well, why does he uh, allow us to get sick and have accidents and have diseases? Uh, why are there natural disasters? Why is there crime and death? And so there in your notes on, on page, uh, page three, why do people get sick? Well, they get sick because of the curse of sin. When God made mankind, he made us in his image, Genesis 1, To be made in the image of God means this. It means we have intellect, emotion, and will. Intellect, Adam named the animals, Genesis 2, 19. Emotion, Adam feared after he sinned, I was afraid, Genesis 3, 10. Will, Adam chose sin, Genesis 3, 12, Romans 5, 12. And because of sin, because of Adam's sin, we live in a world under the curse of sin. 
Sin is the root cause of all sickness, of all disease, of all disasters, of all crime and death. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. And sickness is part of the dying process. It is not God's will that we live forever in healthy bodies on the earth. I have performed several funerals for charismatic Christians. We get sick and we die. This sin has been passed on from one generation to another generation to us and to our kids and to our grandkids. This sin has been passed on to our natural world, which Romans 8.22 says, the whole world groaneth. It groaneth. And you hear it in the howl of the wind. You hear it in the howl of the wild animals. But one day Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's, he's going to set up an earthly kingdom. He's going to remove the curse of sin. No more poison ivy, all right? <laughs> no more poison ivy. I look forward to that great day. Uh, the lion and lamb will lie down together. And so the curse of sin is a reason people get sick. But you know, Satan, page four, Satan is another reason people get sick. Job chapter two. Job became sick because of Satan. We find it in Matthew 12 and Luke 8, Luke, thir uh, Luke 13. Jesus gave some instances because of the demonic spirits that people uh, did become sick. But there's another reason people become sick, and it is, the, it is the glory of God. It is the glory of God. Jesus is walking with his disciples, and they see this man who's been blind for 38 years, and the disciples said, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? It's kind of a ridiculous question. How, how can a guy sin in the mother's womb and be born blind and be the cause of the blindness? And Jesus said, no, this man is blind, not because of his sin, not because of his parents' sin. This man is born blind that you might see the works of God and give glory to God. Sickness can be a source of the glory of God in our lives. Jesus gave that man sight. And you know where he gave that man sight? Kind of ties in. Not in my notes, but it just came to me. It was the pool of Siloam. It's where the Hezekiah's tunnel water pulls. Jesus spit in the dirt. He made some mud, put it on his eyelids, and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and you will see. And so he had to get someone to lead him to the pool of Siloam, and he washed his eyes. I want you to know that Jesus, Jesus healed him, and he gave his sight. Sickness can be for the glory of God. As a young charismatic, Joni Erickson Tata once believed that God would heal her and let her walk again. How many know the story of, of Joni Erickson Tata? Would you raise your hand? She went to Catherine Kuhlman Crusades more than once, a famous faith healer, only to leave disappointed in her wheelchair. Oh, she saw others get up out of their wheelchair for minor back pains, but the ushers would escort her out a side aisle. Now, 47 years later, after her accident that left her a paraplegic, God has still not healed her, but her perspective is one of great faith. She says, God may remove your suffering, and that will be great cause for praise. But if not, he will use anything and everything that stands in the way of his fellowship with you. So let God mold you and transform you from glory to glory. That's the deeper healing. God will answer your prayers by either changing your circumstances or changing you in your circumstances. And so we always pray, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And so here it is. If you want to be prepared for 2016, you, you need to, to prepare to meet God. You, you need to, to be able to cultivate a prayer life. Number three, you need to treat people right. You need to treat people right. And so look what, what we find here in 2 Kings 20 and verse 2. He turned his face to the wall and he prayed. What was his prayer? Verse 3. I beseech thee, O Lord, 
Remember now how I walk before thee in truth with a perfect heart, and have done that which is right, done that which is good in thy sight, and Hezekiah wept sore. During our tour of Israel five years ago, the tour guide explained the people who lived outside the wall of Jerusalem were in danger of attack by the enemy. And Hezekiah expanded the walls of Jerusalem to include protection for the poor people of the city. I'm going to show you that now. It's called Hezekiah's Broad Wall. Uh, it was 26 feet high, 26 feet thick, a great defensive broad wall. You know what? He treated people right. And the reason he treated people right is because of his love and obedience to God. May I say that in 2016, your love for God, your faithfulness to church makes a difference. It says this about him in chapter 18, verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments. So what happened? 2 Kings 20, what happened is verse 4. It came to pass that Isaiah, before he was gone out to the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. So here Isaiah says, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to die. Set your house in order. Bye. Have a great day. And as he's walking out, goes through this door. He's in the middle court. He's not even in the outer court. Hezekiah prayed that quick. God says, Stop. Go back and give him a new message. God has heard the prayer of your heart. And he says, I'm going to give you 15 more years to live. You know, this is, this is a stab in the back of the hyper-Calvinist. God would answer prayer that quickly? Oh, yes, he did. I want you to see one more thing before we close, and that's verse 7. Isaiah took a lump of figs, and they took it and laid it on the boil that was going to kill him, and he recovered. And so when bad things happen, we pray. We pray for healing. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. James 5, 14. Has God promised to heal everybody who has faith? No. He doesn't promise to heal everybody this side of heaven. I want you to know that heaven is our ultimate healing, where God says there'll be no pain, sickness, or death. Sometimes God heals through medicine. Sometimes through surgery. Sometimes the natural healing process already built into our bodies. Sometimes he may heal supernaturally because it is his will, but it is always God that heals. The anointing of oil in James 5.14 does not seem to be a ceremonial anointing. Greek scholar A.T. Robertson says the word means to rub as in a medicinal application. The good Samaritan poured oil into the wounds of the robbed man. It is an outward rubbing of oil on the body to massage them. There's a different Greek word used for ceremonial in the ceremonial sense. So in verse 7, what we have here is a, a, what we call a poultice. Uh, your great-grandma, your grandma may have used it. God uses medicines, uh, yet he performs the miracle of the healing. Jeremiah said, behold, uh, of the uh, healing balm of Gilead. There are some people who don't believe in doctors or medical care. May I say they do not get that from the Bible. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, Matthew 9, 12. Luke was the beloved physician. Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, anoint their eyes with the local eye salve, and he made a spiritual application, Revelation 3, 18. Now, how can you be prepared for 2016? How, how can you set your house in order? Prepare to meet God, cultivate a prayer life, treat people right. One final challenge. If you've never read through your Bible ever, then why not make 2016 the year? For 31 years, I've challenged people on the first Sunday of the year. If you've never read through your Bible, make 2016 your year. How would you like to die and go to heaven and say, God, I didn't have time to read the Bible? Didn't have time to read the Bible? It's time to watch sports, time to play video games, time for this, time for that. You never read through the Bible one time. And so if God leads you, it's not, it's not the pastor guilt tripping you to do it. If you've never read through your Bible, you just put your name right there and you become disciplined enough and read through it in 2016. It'll change your life. Change mine. That's why I'm here today. Father, thank you for this holy word that we have. 
Thank you for the helpful guidance you give to each one of us as we open it, read it, and believe it. Bless in the invitation. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You'd say, Pastor, I am prepared to meet God. I have been saved. I am born again. If you have that kind of peace and confidence, would you simply raise your hand all over? You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I've never been saved. I want to prepare to meet God. I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again, and today I want to receive him as my own Savior and trust him alone for salvation. Would you raise your hand if that's you? I would like to trust Christ as my Savior. Anyone at all, just hold your hand up high, and you can call upon the name of the Lord today. Christian, would you ask God to give you spiritual goals, family goals, life goals, that are reachable, attainable with God's help in 2016. Father, may you bless in the invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. May we stand together as we sing a song of invitation. 534, cleanse me as we sing. Let God have his way in your life. Maybe you want to pray at the altar. You want to seek to speak to a pastor, a pastor's wife, make an appointment. You come as we sing together on the first verse as we do what God tells us to do to search our hearts. Would you come? So seated. I'd like to ask our men to be able to draw your attention to our missionary of the week, to be able to pray uh, for uh, Jonathan Angela serving there in uh, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, and you can read about what, uh, how God is using them there. They have a, a new baby uh, as well. You can pray for them. And then our academy homecoming uh, is this Friday. Ushers are going to come. Uh, we have a free pass if you'd like to come out and uh, cheer on your patriots. Uh, updated church address directories are available in the bookstore. If you did read through your Bible in 2015, be sure to sign up at the welcome desk. We would like to prepare a certificate for you for next week, and that encourages others as well. Uh, Secret Sisters meet tonight at 5 o'clock in the library. Ladies' Bible study begins Tuesday at 9.30. And then on the back of your uh, bulletin, you'll see a prayer list. If you pray for Frank Imbo, recovery from surgery, for Terry and his recovery, uh, Cheryl Fisher, recovery from back surgery. She's here today. And then pray for her father, who is not doing well, recovery from his surgery. Bob Moses has a surgery coming up on the 8th. And then uh, Brother Dick Greer told me about his son-in-law, Mark Mann. He's a pastor in California. His son-in-law took a fall off a roof and uh, hit his head in the cement, and he is bleeding in the brain. If you'd pray uh, for his healing, and then also we want to uh, congratulate them on 50 years. So congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Uh, and then welcome Bonnie Harris. Glad to have Bonnie here uh, uh, in her recovery from her knee surgery. Parkhouse services today, if you'd like to come, uh, three or four folks to come about 210 to help wheel, wheel the residents, the auditorium, if you have the f not had the flu shot, they'll have a, a mask for you. School of the Bible is Saturday mornings for four weeks uh, starting January 16. Bible, geography, and customs will be taught by Pastor Elstock. It'll build your faith. It'll help you to understand many things in the Word of God. Please sign up using the envelope in the lobby on the Oak uh, drop box. And then you've seen the bulletin there, uh, Spirit Week. If you'd like to stop by Chick-fil-A, take this little uh, uh, paper with you from the bulletin, and uh, that'll help out the uh, Academy Athletic uh, Department. All right, at this time, Jill Fitzpatrick's going to come. We'd like to have a ministry highlight once a month so you can know uh, about our different ministries and you can pray for them. And maybe you'd like to be uh, a part in serving. So, Jill, uh, we appreciate Rebecca. Let's see. It was Re Penny for many years uh, serving in our... Uh, 
uh, a nursery director. And now, Jill, thank you for taking it. This is also the lady and her helpers who did all the Christmas decorations that were so beautiful. Tell us about the nursery ministry. Thank you so much for this opportunity just to share about nursery and um, just to be able to share the needs that we have in nursery at this time. Um, I'm excited to be able to serve in this role and look forward to what God has planned for the upcoming year. Um, it's such an important ministry for the church. Um, it not only provides a loving and nurturing environment for the kids, but more importantly for the parents to be able to um, enjoy uh, service, ABF classes, serve in other ministries knowing that their kids um, are in a safe and loving environment. Um, it's, I just heard from a mom last night through an email just telling me how much of a blessing the nursery has been for her um, for the past two years. Um, it's also been a blessing for me personally, just being able to watch the kids grow in their different developmental stages from the infant all the way up to two-year-olds. Um, it's just neat. I saw um, Judah roll over last week. He's rolling all over the place, and it's just fun to share in that with the parents. Um, it's been definitely an exciting year this year for nursery. We've had, well, we've had I think eight babies so far, three more on the way. Um, so we have a lot of needs back there right now. Um, we have different roles in the nursery. One is um, just the greeter or check-in where you're checking kids in and out through the computer, handing the kids over from their parents to the room, having them fill out the cards with special instructions. Um, we have room leaders within the nursery and they just touch base with all of the workers for that week. Um, to just make sure we have coverage for all of the rooms and then they just make sure they're showing up and, and filling in where needed or finding help where needed. Um, and then we have our monthly volunteers. Um, you're assigned to a room and then you're assigned the same Sunday of every month so you know exactly what Sunday you're serving each and every month. Um, so our current needs in the nursery, um, we do have about four openings that need to be filled for the 1030 service, and then about two openings for a Sunday evening service. Um, and then another thing um, I think would be nice if we could have, you might not want to serve in the nursery on a monthly basis, but you may want to serve once or twice here or there throughout the year when we have special services like Christmas, Revival, Missions Conference. Um, so if you'd like, you could sign up just for those special services. I'd like to have a list of people that are interested in doing that, and then we can call on you just for those special times of year. Um, so if you're interested in any of these wonderful opportunities, <laughs> there's a table set up in the lobby. Feel free to go back there. There are some sign-ups. Um, there's also background checks. That's very important right now. It's required by the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so you will have to go through those background checks. If you're currently working in the nursery, you haven't obtained those, please do that immediately. You can get those at the table as well. Um, and then I just want to thank everyone who is faithfully serving in the nursery now. It's such a blessing again to all of the families here. And for those of you considering working in the nursery, I just want to remind you it's not just babysitting the kids for an hour. It's being able to see those kids grow throughout their time in the different rooms there. And it's also an opportunity to minister to the families with young children here. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jill. If you would say, you know, I'm just not going to be part of the nursery ministry, would you pray for it? And would you consider maybe being a substitute as well for special events? That would be a great blessing. This is Ariana McCann, who was once in our nursery. And Ariana has come. She has received the Lord as her Savior. One more step. Come on down here. All right. Oh, let me get her up here so you can see her. Ariana... Her mom and uh, dad lead our RU ministry, which is a blessing to so many, both in our church and in our community. We're so glad that you've been saved. Ariana has trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And we're so happy that you've been saved upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Congratulations, Ariana. God bless you.
Uh, Pastor Joyner, could you come and tell us about the, uh, uh, the Share Joy event this coming Saturday? It was in my Bible, in the back of my Bible. And right. you tell us about that and lead us in closing prayer. I'll be glad to do that. If you want to stand, I'll go ahead and give the rest of those announcements. We have a Share Joy outreach coming up this Saturday at 10 o'clock. And what we'll do, we'll meet in here in the auditorium. I think there's some other things happening in the chapel a little bit later. So we'll come in here Saturday morning at 11 or 10 o'clock this coming Saturday. There's going to be many opportunities for you, so we need as many to come out as possible. And uh, some of those uh, concern writing letters to ones that are shut in or have been through illnesses are also letters of celebration cards to them. And then also visiting those that are shut ins and uh, some other outreach opportunities that we have. So we'd love to see you out this Saturday morning. I also want to let you know about evangelism class that starts this Wednesday night. It goes for four weeks, so four consecutive Wednesday nights. Learn about sharing your faith. There's only room for 16. So first 16 to come that are committed for four weeks, uh, we'll see you down in Chapel A this Wednesday night at 715. I want to thank Pastor Wonder for a powerful message from the Word of God. It's the Bible, not some other man's written word or whatever that is. I'm getting so excited up here. I'm fired up. Good day for you too, brother. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we're thrilled. We're excited. We're amazed. We can call you Father. But we just want to thank you this January 3rd, 2016 morning that we know you and you've given us opportunity, Lord, to be connected with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you for Ariana and her decision for baptism. Thank you for the powerful word of God. Thank you for a church to come and hear the clear preaching of the word of God, the singing, the celebration, the fellowship, Lord, the encouragement, the strengthening that, Lord, you equip us to go out into the mission field you called us to. Find us faithful in that this week. Bless the services to follow as well. We give it all to you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.